Live from the headquarters of Ramsey Solutions, broadcasting from the Pods Moving and Storage Studios. It's the Ramsey Show, where we help people build wealth, do work that they love, and create actual amazing relationships. Rachel Cruz, number one best-selling author multiple times, co-host of the popular afternoon Smart Money Happy Hour. I just assumed happy hours were in the afternoon. Hey, yeah, so check it out on podcast on the Ramsey Networks there, and uh, you can be part of all of that and enjoy her. She's with me today, my daughter, answering your questions at 888-825-5225. Sean's in Los Angeles. Hey, Sean, how are you? I'm doing well. How about you? Better than I deserve. What's up? Yeah, uh, I just had a quick question for you guys. Um, so I'm a first-gen American immigrant family, grew up a low middle income. And so I went through college, debt free. I made sure to go on scholarship. And then I recently graduated and got a job. Um, and then the first year I made 180K. Um, <laughs> and with that, I love it. Yeah. Uh, Way to go. Yeah, what are you so, doing when you're out of college for 180K? That's impressive. So my job required me to do a lot of travel. So, you know, I sold my car during the peak of the pandemic to get... Now, what do you do for a living that makes 180 k Oh, I am an aerospace engineer. Oh, I guess you are. Way to go, man. Amazing. Good for (laughs) you. I appreciate it. I bet your mom and dad are just sitting around smiling. Yeah, yeah. yeah. My son, the genius. Uh, (laughs) So, yeah, my main question was basically, um, so I had to buy a new car. When I came back, like switch job um and now that i'm in los angeles you know i have i'm trying to max out my retirement and everything and i enjoy my job but it's kind of i grew up in a situation where you know we made sure to you know save what we can don't buy anything unnecessary and recently i've been kind of i have like a good amount of uh, of wealth in the savings and everything like that and my question is more of how to kind of get past the idea of you know scared to spend it and then on top of that how to invest it properly so that I don't spend too much and kind of build a budget for myself for the future. Yeah. What, where's your family from, Sean? Uh, we're based out of, Oh, so my family's from India originally. India. Okay. Okay. That's great. Um, yeah. yeah you know, I think when it comes to the idea of giving your per, yourself permission to spend, um, it's always helpful for me, Sean, to have something visual that I see with my numbers. So that would be a budget. Mm-hmm. and doing it, knowing exactly where my expenses, where my money's going to know that my bases are covered, that I'm doing, quote unquote, what I'm supposed to be doing with money, right? So uh, making sure retirement's good, we're saving for the future, all of that is done. And when you look at that and say, okay, and then I have some left over, and actually putting it in line items and kind of like making yourself, forcing yourself to spend, which sounds kind of funny, but uh, when we talk about money a lot, it's almost like building a muscle and spending is one of those muscles that you you have to build. If you're not used to it or you're scared and you have that kind of more scarcity mentality, it is very difficult to enjoy your money and just to spend. So um, if you're in a position where you do have that extra money every month, I would put it in a line item. And again, it can be a small percentage. You don't have to do anything crazy. Uh, but I would put mm-hmm. it in a line item and and make yourself spend it. Again, whether that's going to a concert, whether that's going out to eat, whether that's going on a trip, like whatever that looks like, but uh, practicing spending and enjoying it because that is part of living. Yeah. And being mm-hmm. generous, investing, and spending wisely. These are the three things you can do. Okay. Gotcha. And, and spending yeah. wisely is the enjoyment factor, so to speak. You're, you'll find later as you go along that generosity is actually more enjoyable than all of it. But um, mm-hmm. anyway, you need to be doing all three at all times. Then when you're doing a budget, like Rachel's saying, we have a, uh, the world's best budgeting app that you can use for free. It's called Every Dollar. And the reason it's called Every mm-hmm. Dollar is every month you should give every dollar a name. Every dollar a mission, every dollar an assignment. And here's what's interesting. Once you're doing that, very few people mess up because we do stupid stuff when we don't see it in perspective to the other things like, oh, I can afford that. Oh, wait, I can't buy groceries, you know, but if you got groceries down beside it, you go, oh, I can't afford that. Uh, But if you buy a couch and you go, well, uh, and I've still got money to do all the other stuff. And it was allocated with one of the dollar line items, like Rachel was saying, then there's no guilt for buying the couch because you didn't not pay your rent because you bought a couch. But 
Right. But when you just go, oh, I'm going to buy a couch on impulse, and it's not in pers- it doesn't have the perspective, the holistic perspective of your whole picture that the budget gives you. Mm-hmm. That's when people make mistakes. But very few people do stupid stuff on purpose. You know, right? Like right. we're going to write down and plan to do stupid stuff. That just, people don't do that. So that's why the budget fixes that for you. It'll cause you to to be careful in all of it, in generosity, in, in spending, and in investing. And do it very, very intentional. And then, of course, we're going to tell you to take the free money that you can find in that budget and work up what we call the baby steps, which is the shortest, fastest, right way to become wealthy. Gotcha. Yeah, because, you know, after my last job and I spent money on getting a brand new car um, and I didn't take any any loans because the idea of having to owe someone any form is kind of paranoia for me. Good. Um, So I carry about 70k and just in my as an emergency plan i know i don't need that much um and i know i can invest about 40k of that yeah then do have plenty of leftover then do um so i guess investing portion wise do you guys have any recommendations as far as how to make sure whether that's passive or or kind of opportunities in the stock market or other ways to yeah. i guess further my wealth Tell you what, I'm going to send you a copy of the book, The Total Money Makeover, which is going to walk you right up the baby steps, what to do first, what to do second. When you get to what's called baby step four, you'll start putting 15, it's the first time you invest, you'll start putting 15% of your income into retirement savings, Roth IRAs and 401ks and good growth stock mutual funds. So hang on, we'll have Austin and the team pick up and send you a Total Money Makeover book. It's the... um, it's the baby steps on steroids. It'll show you every little thing on what to do with the baby steps. Sam is with us in Boston. Hey, Sam, how are you? I'm doing amazing. How are you doing, Dave? Better than I deserve. How can we help? Yeah, so I'm calling in. Um, I got a career question for you guys. I recently uh, just moved into baby step three and just got engaged, which is super exciting. Um, so... I'm calling because I currently, I, I'm, I work as a assistant project manager for a infrastructure company, and I travel from, for work. Um, I live in upstate New Hampshire, so kind of outside of Boston by just a couple of hours. Um, I live in a small town up in the White Mountains. Um, but I'm calling because I'm kind of struggling uh, being, you know, newly engaged and everything. Uh, eventually, I, I don't want traveling to be a long term. How much do you um, travel? Long term. Um, so I'm out on the road every week. Uh, right now, for example, five I'm days working, a week. Uh, uh, yeah, it depends on on the week and what's going on with the project. But yeah. um, I'm fortunate to be able to go home on weekends. Yeah, sounds like you're changing jobs. I mean, it's pretty simple. Not a sustainable lifestyle with yeah. the family. Not what it's you hard. want to do. It's not. You don't want to be gone five days a week. You said. And I don't think they're going to stop you from doing that because they need you to go do that. That's why they hired you. Sorry to cut you short, but it is pretty that sim- pretty much that simple. If you're like most people, your home is your most valuable asset. And when you want to make improvements, it can feel like everything costs too much or takes too long. But something as simple as custom window coverings from Blinds.com can completely change your space and add value to your home. We've recommended Blinds.com for over a decade, so you know you can trust them. From blinds, drapes, and shutters to motorized shades, they make it easy and affordable to upgrade your entire home, and their team is ready to help with everything from design consultation to measuring and installation. Plus, there are never any misleading quotes or hidden fees. Everything's backed by their 100% satisfaction guarantee, and shipping is always free. See why Blinds.com is the number one online retailer of custom window coverings. Go to Blinds.com now and save 40% off selected products. Visit Blinds.com today for more info.
Rachel Cruz, Ramsey Personality, is my co-host today. Justin is in Austin, Texas. Hi, Justin. Welcome to the Ramsey Show. Thank you for having me. It's an honor to be on. Certainly. How can we help? I have a kind of what would Dave do question. Um, I'm My wife is looking to leave education and go back to get her master's to become a therapist. And so I'm looking for the best way to approach to cash flow this and not take out any debt. Um, we currently make about 200000 a year. Uh, the only debt we have is our home and one rental, which we are aggressively paying off and trying to get paid off in the next three years. Mm-hmm. And so my big question is, should I suspend retirement knowing I get a generous match from my employer uh, to help cash flow this or just tighten up the budget. I'm curious what you would do. Um, so a master's in counseling. Correct. Okay. To do what? To uh, be a therapist, to counsel uh, families, adolescents, um, you know, families in need, those kind of things. Okay. Um, so th- as you're probably already aware, there is a vast spectrum of potential cost on this. You can spend, you can spend already, a, a we, lot or a little. And we already have the cost, so I know exactly how much it's going to cost me per month. How much is it going to cost you? Right about 1400 And that's the exact amount before tax if I was to pause my retirement that I'd be getting each month. Now, when you said your household income, those 200 Correct. Why can't you just cash flow 1400 and keep doing your retirement? And that's what we're thinking about doing. We just didn't know if it'd be wise to suspend knowing that she could potentially come out of this making you know, right around 80 to 100 K a year. And then that would just make things not so tight. So again, I don't want to sacrifice the retirement, but if I had to, I'm willing to, I just, again, want to make sure I'm making the right decision. I, I would. Yeah. It would be more sacrificing lifestyle, Justin, than retirement is what we, is what we would probably pick. Hmm. Um, and, and is it a two year program? Uh, minimum two year could be two and a half ish, depending on her okay. uh, internships. Yep. Gotcha. And how old are you guys? I'm 38. She's 34. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I would continue to probably just do retirement. Um, Yeah, I would, and then sacrifice lifestyle. I mean, I know it makes it kind of tight, and I don't know if even there's a extra work you could pick up just as a side hustle. You know, every other week for a little bit just to bring in some extra cash, you could do that as well. Does she quit while she's doing this? So she's gonna the first year when she's just doing classes, she's gonna work part time, so that will help offset a little bit of the cost. But then as she goes into her clinicals or or, or internships, that will increase where she might. Not so when all of that much. happens, what's the household income? Uh, well, well, so my income is with the two hundred is not what she's making right now. So anything she makes will be additional to that. Oh, so you gotcha. make two hundred? Okay, correct. Yep. Yeah, that's yeah. great then, because if she's working part time a little bit next year, then that's gonna give you guys some breathing room, and then it's really only a year. And maybe a few months of it yeah. being really focused on just cutting some lifestyle if you need I mean, to. She makes 15000 a year. She cash flowed it. Correct. Yeah, which is what we're going to try to do. Just yeah. we're not sure of the workload just yet. But ideally, we would like to not sacrifice retirement if we didn't have to. I don't think yeah. you have to. I think you have to sacrifice something else. You make two hundred. You need 15000 Yeah, no, I, I agree. Yeah, I, I, think, I think you yep. cut. I think you don't go on vacation because we have a greater goal. I think we back Christmas yep. down. Because you have a greater goal. I think we quit going out to eat so dad gum much because you have a greater goal or whatever your lifestyle, yeah. whatever you whatever you want to lump into the lifestyle category. What Rachel was saying is dead on. Yeah, it's it, this is a lifestyle cut. Uh, and, it, and again, it's temporary for a greater goal. And it's a wonderful greater goal. I mean, what she's going into is good. Uh, what you're paying for it is a mm-hmm. reasonable amount. Mm-hmm. I mean, she's going to get this degree in the thirty thirty five thousand dollars range um, and, you know, be helping people this is this is a good move this is this is education the way it's supposed to be used uh to actually cause you to make more and do good you know that's what education's for as opposed to getting a degree in left-handed puppetry which some people do and this kind of stuff so yeah that that's this is very very good all everything you brought to us was wise except you guys just haven't looked at we're, we need to scale back lifestyle and keep on our investment goals yep that's what i would do so uh good question Thanks for calling. Tommy is in Augusta, Georgia. Hey, Tommy, what's up? Hey, Dave. Wow, I'm so happy I got through to you. Me too. We're We're happy you're here, Tommy. What's up? How can we help? (laughs) Hey, um, I've been listening to the podcast every day um, uh, for maybe a month and a half. I uh, 
so many, so much of your stuff uh, just makes a whole lot of financial sense to me. And and I want to, I admire the fact that you guys bring Christ onto the radio every single day, and you guys are not ashamed of the of the gospel. Well, thank you, Tommy. How can we help you today? You're welcome. I have. Uh, I'm, I'm getting married June second. Yay! Um, I'm, I'm 52 years old. I've never been married, and I'm a little I'm a little anxious, but I'm very excited. Uh, my fiance and I, uh, but between the the two of us, um, well, I'll just talk about my debt right now. Um, I have about eighteen eighteen thousand five hundred in student loan debt. Uh, probably another, uh, 3,000 in, a, a furniture, furniture debt. And I also have, um, I have my, my mortgage, uh, 90, 98,000. So when we get married, I will be moving, uh, to her house that she has and we'll be selling mine. Um, the market value right now, I believe on mine is a roughly 165. So I think I'm going to come out a little ahead. And I also have, uh, $20,000 in a high yield savings account right now. I am, I've been reluctant to pay off this student loan debt all because of this, uh, this uh, wish, wishful thinking that they're going to forgive it. Um, but I also understand that I received that money as a loan years ago. Tommy, how can we and best help you I today? I, I'm just trying to, uh, I don't, I'm, I guess I'm, com- uh, where to com- start. I just don't know. I just don't know enough yet. Um, okay. About what you guys are teaching. I'm very interested in it, and I would like to. I've been telling my fiance about it, and and the little bit that I know that I'm, you know, telling her about, I'm, I don't know if if, she, if it's really clear. If I'm getting through clear to her. Okay, so Tommy, um, what we're gonna do first and foremost is Austin's gonna pick up, and we're gonna gift you and your fiance, who will be your wife in two weeks, our wedding gift. A wedding gift. So. So congratulations, Tommy. You get a wedding and Financial Peace University (laughs) coming up. And so you go through that together so you guys can at least be talking out of the same, you know, with the same language, out of the same perspective. But what you're going to do, Tommy, yeah, is I would take that money that in the high yield savings account, pay off the furniture first, get rid of that $3,000 loan, and then start tackling the student loan debt. And the beautiful thing is, Tommy, when you guys sell your home, you're going to come out with about... 65,000. And if she has any debt, then you're going to use some of that money to pay off hers. You guys together are going to combine your finances. So you're going to look at all of your debt together lined up regardless of whose debt it is and start working a plan to pay that off. You guys are going to combine incomes. You're going to be budgeting together. Uh, so that's really the first big step and then get an emergency fund. Then you'll go on to baby steps four, five, and six, but you're, you're going to dive deep into all of that with Financial Peace University. So I, I would sit down and you guys go through that together because that, that is the plan and working together is a really key part of this. And I know all this is, you know, new to you, maybe even new to her, um, of just this idea of being intentional with your money. And so I think it's kind of a, a fun thing for you, Tommy, that you're entering a new season of life as a married man for the first time. And there's probably gonna be this level of feeling like other changes are going to happen and your money is probably going to look a lot different a year from now, which is very exciting because you may actually end up controlling it and feeling in control of it for the first time ever. So hang on the line, Tommy. Austin will pick up.
Y'all, there's a lot you can't control when it comes to healthcare, but there is something you should check out that can help. Christian Healthcare Ministries. CHM is not insurance. It is budget-friendly, biblically-based health cost sharing. That means a community of members helping share the burden of each other's healthcare costs. They help people just like you in all 50 states. So see if CHM could be right for your family. Learn more today at chministries.org slash budget. Rachel Cruz, Ramsey Personality, is my co-host today. Thank you for joining us, America. We're so glad you're here. We love to give away money around here. I know that sounds weird, uh, a place that is all about helping you with your money. We give money away, and we're giving away $500 a week this month and a $3,000 grand prize in the Ramsey Cash Giveaway. No purchase necessary. You can enter up to once a day. You must be 18 years old or older. And there's great deals in the uh, RamseySolutions.com bookstore and all the books, just about all of them are bestsellers and just about all of them are $10 right now. And that includes the... uh Questions for Humans cards by uh, second edition. The conversation cards out with Dr. John Deloney. So there's all kinds of things there. So be sure you check all this out. $10 sale and $500 a week at $3,000 total grand prize giveaway. All available at RamseySolutions.com slash store. John is in Dallas. Hey, John, welcome to the Ramsey Show. Thank you. It's It's an absolute pleasure speaking with you guys today. You too. What's up? So I, um, uh, my employer offers an employee stock purchase plan at a 15% discount. And um, I'm the type of guy that buys and buys and buys and buys stocks and just holds and holds forever. And should I, when, when it comes to employee stock purchase plan, should I buy it and then wait for a year for long-term capital gains and sell it? Or should I buy it and sell it right away? What would be the strategy for that? Well, I generally don't recommend you buy it at all. Uh, If you're going to buy it, don't let it become more than 10% of your net worth. Uh, Single stocks are much too risky. And the 15% discount is nothing special. Every single company that has an employee stock option plan has a 15% discount. They're all set up that way. And so, um, and if you'll pull up your 52-week charts on the stock, Unless it's a very unusual stock, you'll see as much as 15% variance during the 52 weeks. So, in other words, you could lose anything the discount is in one move of the stock. And so, it's not like it's a huge discount. 50% discount would be huge. 15% in the single stock, as volatile as they are, not that big a deal. So, if you love your company and your company has a great track record and the stock looks like a great stock to buy and you're just absolutely chomping at the bit to do it, don't allow single stocks as a category to become more than 10% of your total net worth. John, I don't buy any single stocks. I don't own a one. Yeah, and there's – I feel like a lot of employees, because we get this question on the regular, I feel like, um, because I feel like for some people, too, they – if they have a good work experience and they love their company and they Doesn't believe mean in the it. stock's good. No, I know. But that's what I'm saying is like it, it, it's a there's an emotional tie for people with work as well when this comes into play. So you do want to if that becomes uh, if those two collide, you want to uh, detach the emotion from it. But I mean, I've, heard, I've talked to people and they're like, I just love my company so much. It's just so great. And I'm going to be here for it. And I just believe in it. And it's like it's a more of an emotional. Yeah. Type and of, and of not, investment, that and that's is a not bad, a wise that's way. That's a really bad idea. Yeah. yeah. But the thing that the lack of diversification is what we're talking about here. When you've got all your eggs in one basket, some fool is twirling the basket, you know, and that's, that's the old uh, financial planning thing. The first time I ran into this early, like 25 years ago, I was sitting one on one doing a coaching session with a lady who was 70 years old, and she had worked for Procter and Gamble for 40 years. And she had all 
of her 401k and all of her wealth, $780,000 in Procter & Gamble stock. Well, I don't remember what happened. I don't even remember what year it was. But that year, Procter & Gamble had some crises and they lost 38% of their value. Mm. And so her 780000 turned into like four hundred. Yeah. And she was freaking out. But the reason was she had left herself vulnerable. That's a high-risk play because you you bet the farm. You, you went up to the booth at the Kentucky Derby, and you bet the family farm on one horse. Mm-hmm. And then somebody shoots the horse. I mean, you know, this. Oh my gosh. Well, I mean, this is what happens, right? This is the kind of garbage you get into. Or the horse didn't win. I know. Well, I mean, it could be just that simple. But yeah, it'd be more dramatic if you did it my way. But the, uh, I mean, this is what happens in these companies, right? Yeah, totally. I mean, it's yeah. just you lose your mind. I'm now in the George Camel camp now. Yeah, I've got. The, I've now got the horse horses. haters after me. But me. I wasn't killing horses. It was a bad metaphor. Okay. Oh my gosh. Anyway, we love the horses. whole booth is in the floor laughing. My kids love spirits. The, the cartoon. It's great. We love horses here. Yes, yes. We're, we're <laughs> Regardless of oh loud what comes. Anyway, don't put all of your eggs in one basket. Don't bet the farm on one horse. Don't have a large portion of your net worth any more than 10% in single stocks. Tons of research projects, like hundreds of them, that will show you that individuals buying individual stocks thinking they know what they're doing, lose money more often than they make money, and on average only make about a 7% rate of return on their portfolio because they don't know what the flip they're doing. They're not diversified, and it's a bad idea. So I only buy mutual funds for that reason, and I know a lot about it. I mean, I, could, I, can, I know how to pick a stock. Uh, and it wouldn't be based on the fact that I like the color of the company that was on the sign or some kind of crap that people do all the time. So, I mean, you know, none of that. It's, we're going to get into the actual financials on it. But all of that to say, I don't want to make a 7% rate of return because I've made over 12% by people who pick stocks for a living all day long for a billion-dollar mutual fund. They're smarter than me. Yeah. And they're more specialized, and they spend their whole life on – Every little nuance of that. Well, and what's interesting today, and because of apps, technology, and just the ability for the average person to jump in to the market. Well, is, I mean, is, stuff is, like Robinhood. Is an easier, yeah. it's, there's an easier access point. So yeah. people are doing it more and it's, more because it's accessible. I mean, like you can just, it's right there. You just well, download Robinhood the Well, Robinhood has acted like they have democratized trading. No, you didn't. You're just an app where people can buy stocks and do stupid butt stuff. And they do it all the time. That's all it is. And that's yes. how you got into the GameStop thing. Right. That's how you got into all this other but stuff. But what I'm saying is the average consumer back in the 80s, it, it's, yeah. it, was a, it was a much... Day traders. Yeah, it was a much... It was a, it was a whole sit, thing. We had computers and we could connect. Bare, in the 80s. And we could... Yes. We Barely had internet though. Yeah. And we could buy stuff and do stock trades. Now, I had a friend that was a stock trader. That's what he did for a living. He lost 78% of his money in one year. Yeah, it was just dumber than a rock. You know, I mean, it's just this. Is, I've seen it over and over and over and over again. So all that to say, John, not saying you're dumb and I'm not saying what you're doing horrible. I'm just giving you some guidelines and the reasons behind them. Don't do more than 10 percent of your total net worth in a stock. Pick the stock for the right reasons. 15 percent discount is not much. Those are our comments on your question. So really, really good thing to think about. So it even says it in the Bible. Spread your portions to seven, yes, to eight, for disaster may come upon the land or the horse. Or yeah, the, that the, poor the horse. Disaster could come. You know, Just disaster sad. could come. Sad about that and horse. So, that poor horse. Damn. And so, yeah. But the <laughs> metaphorical horse. But yeah. The, don't bet the family farm at the racetrack on one race. And that's essentially what you're doing, right? Because you got all your net worth tied up in a single play and... Versus a mutual fund, which is 90 to 200 Different stocks, stocks in there. So yeah. that's the safety of it. That's where. Yeah, the spreading out of your money. Spread your money around. That's diversification. You hear financial people say, I have a well-diversified portfolio. Well, that's all that means. You spread your money around. Money is like manure. It makes more when you spread it. You know, doesn't you left in one pile, stinks. Spread it out, grow stuff. That's how it works. So same exact thing. And uh, just keep it, keep it, you know, keep it simple. Don't try to be fancy. 
and you'll always make more money, people. You'll always make more money in the long haul. This is The Ramsey Show. Cruz, Ramsey Personality, is my co-host today, number one best-selling author. KC is in New York City. Hi, KC. How are you? Hey, Dave. I'm good. How are you? Better than I deserve. What's up? Um, so I'm kind of a, a newer listener, and uh, before I actually found you, I had filed bankruptcy. Mm-hmm. And... Um, my current bank, they offer a, it's kind of like a loan, but it's not an actual loan to help you rebuild your credit. Mm-hmm. And what you do is um, you make payments every month to them and they turn it in as you've made on-time payment. And mm-hmm. then at the end, you actually get what you put into it. And they were telling me that uh, with me wanting to buy a house within the next two years, that that would be something that I should do because the bankruptcy would follow me for so long. Yeah. And I was just kind of wanting to get your opinion on it. So you filed a Chapter 7 bankruptcy, a total bankruptcy. Yes. Wiped out all the bills. Yes, sir. Okay. What happened? Um. So to be quite honest, um, I am in recovery. Um, mm-hmm. I was a addict uh, pretty much my entire life. How old are you? And I had a lot of things. Um, I'm 38. What were you on? Uh, heroin. How long you been dry? Uh, two years. Congratulations. Yeah, congrats. Proud of you. Mm-hmm. Proud Thank of you. you. Okay. All right. And how and what was the size of the bankruptcy? How much debt did you have? Uh, all in total, it was about uh, sixty-eight thousand. Okay. All right. Well, KC, in nineteen eighty-eight, I filed bankruptcy. My wife Sharon and I lost everything because I was stupid, and um, I went too far in debt. One of the conclusions I came to uh, coming out of that bankruptcy, and as you said, you're kind of new to our stuff was that I want to avoid debt. I hate debt. If you look up Dave Ramsey on the Internet, about the first thing you're going to see is he hates debt. You know, right after somebody's pissed off at me about something. But somewhere around in there, I'll have Dave hates debt, right? You follow me? Yes, sir. And the reason reason is is that um, obviously it, it didn't land well for me, didn't land well for you. Um, and, uh, you know, it landed us in a mess. It did, it was not a blessing to us. And so, uh, and your most powerful wealth building tool going forward is your debt is your income staying out of debt. And I'll give you this. I, I haven't seen the statistics in a while and I wish Dr. John Deloney was here. He could probably quote one for me, but the recidivism rate, in other words, staying sober, versus not staying sober uh, has a lot to do with controlling your life and keeping it very clean, peaceful, and simple. Would you agree with that? Yes, sir. As opposed to hectic, out of control, chaotic, uh, all those kinds of things. Debt is all of those things. 
it's hectic, it's chaotic, it's you're no longer in control of your money, it has to go to someone else, and all that kind of stuff. So I'm making a case here for you to consider that part of your sobriety even is connected to your continued sobriety is is connected to keeping your life real clean, real simple. And that's no debt. So I'm going to I'm going to try to sell you as hard as I can on you staying away from debt. Now, once we've done that, then we say, OK, why would I need to rebuild my credit? Because the credit rebuild thing is a joke. It's all about uh, I need credit. Why? So I can go into debt. Why? So I can get credit. Why? So I can go into debt. Why? So I can get credit. Why? So I can go into debt. Well, I mean, it's a dog chasing its tail, this whole I'm going to build my credit thing. Can you get a house after filing Chapter 7 bankruptcy in two years using this bank program? I doubt it. I think they lied to you or they don't know what they're talking about. I don't think you're going to get approved in 24 months from a discharge date on a Chapter 7 for a traditional mortgage. I think you might 36 months or 48 months later get approved for a mortgage with absolutely no credit at all after your Chapter 7 bankruptcy. A Chapter 7 bankruptcy stays on your credit bureau report for 10 years. It does not count against you for purposes of a mortgage, but three to four years. I don't think you're going to get a mortgage in two years, no matter what you do, unless you get a subprime ripoff mortgage from this bank that's teasing you with this. I would stay away from those people, KC. Okay. You following all this? That makes sense. Yes, sir. That makes sense. Cool. How's your family? Uh, We are all back together now and uh, doing doing fine. Back together with your wife or what? Uh, My wife and my children. Wow. Mm, That's awesome. How many children have you got? Uh, Three. Okay. I want you to get a house. I don't want the house to get you. And I don't want you to step into a trap pursuing a house too aggressively that's, okay that's what we're trying to avoid so renting kc renting is not is bad fine. in your case you're okay just rent for yeah. a little while we're putting our life back together after a traumatic life experience and dude let me just tell you we work with addicts all the time because a hundred percent of addicts have financial problems eventually so we i've worked with addicts for 30 years and if you beat heroin you are what's known as an unbelievably courageous, strong guy. That is a tough one. You've been dry two years. You're amazing. You hang on. Thank you do you. this. I really appreciate yeah, that. Yeah, you, you play through. You, you, you're fighting the big dragon, and you can win. You're the guy that can do it. But, man, I'm telling you, you're, you're a beast. You get it. We want to help. We want to be part of your recovery. We're going to put you and your wife through Financial Peace University free, and you guys go learn oh, how to handle God, money and really? become – Absolutely. Not joking at all, man. We love people like you. Thank you. Yeah. You go get Thank that stuff and so we'll get we'll, we'll get you into a house the right way, man. Yeah. And not let that house get you. And you stay away from banks. You can't trust them. If you can tell their line, if their mouse move than most of them. Yeah. And if it seems too good to be good, true. There's a few good bankers out there, but good gracious, the rest of you people. Uh, go ahead. Well, I, well, I was just saying, if it sounds too good to be true, then yeah. they know and they're probably feeding on exactly what they know that you want, which is a house. So they're going to create a formula, do something in order to convince you to stay with them. So, you know, it's, it's 1988. Sl- down. Yeah, I would say, Casey, Dave said it earlier, but truly, I'm like, just you guys rebuilding your family after this and slowing down, renting, not making like massive big decisions, right? Getting a steady income, you guys budgeting together, start saving, pay, you know, there's there's just a beauty in rebuilding this and it's going to take time and it's going to be it's going to be a slower process, but that's actually I think the wisest way to do it. And so that includes uh, something like a purchase of a house. Yeah. File bankruptcy in 1988, a banker told me go sign up for every financial magazine. Subscribe to Money Magazine, Forbes, anything like that. And I did. And within five months, I was getting pre-approved credit cards. Mm. We had decided not to borrow money, so we just chopped them up. But, I mean, that's how dumb the system is and how dumb a banker is. Okay, you just filed Chapter 7 bankruptcy on millions of dollars worth of real estate because you're an idiot. So the first thing you do is go sign up for a whole bunch of financial magazines so you can get pre-approved credit cards to really prove you're an idiot. This, this was me, okay? I mean, this is like, God, how dumb can you be? 
But there's, well, al- their always, there's always somebody of course, wants. Of course, he wants you in it. Uh, there's he always wants somebody it. wants to build your credit. Yeah. Just shoot me. Oh my God. To build my credit. Yeah. Why? So I can get into debt. Why? So I can build my credit. Why? So I can get into debt. <laughs> and then we worship at the altar of the great FICO. Great FICO, you bring us offerings. We bring you offerings so you can be provide our provider. You bring us good things, great FICO. We get good things because we have big FICO. <laughs> Everyone wants big FICO. How dumb are we? Man, you people have lost your minds out there. And I, was the, I used to be captain of you. Now I'm not. This is The Ramsey Show. Rachel Cruz. If you love the show and want a deeper dive on your money journey, we have a weekly newsletter that gives you trending and helpful articles and tips on following the Ramsey way. Just go to RamseySolutions.com today to sign up for our newsletter. Again, that's RamseySolutions.com to sign up for our weekly newsletter. from the headquarters of Ramsey Solutions, broadcasting from the pods, moving, and storage studios. It's the Ramsey Show, where we help people build wealth, do work that they love, and create actual amazing relationships. Rachel Cruz, number one best-selling author, co-host of Smart Money Happy Hour, a very new, popular new podcast with George Camel here on the Ramsey Networks, is my co-host today. Thank you for joining us, America. The phone number is 888 825 Tyler is going to start this hour off in Austin, Texas. Hey, Tyler, how are you? Hey, I'm good. How are you? Better than I deserve. What's up? Hey, I was calling. Uh, so my wife and I were on baby steps four, five, and six, and we are thinking about building like an ADU, a little additional dwelling in our backyard, um, and you know, just something small to add some square footage to allow for people to stay when the family comes and visits. Um, maybe a little homeschooling area, and then from time to time, we might Airbnb it out. Um, but I'm looking at doing that and was thinking about taking out a home equity loan for that instead of moving up in house, right? Instead of selling our house and just getting more square footage and because we're kind of getting to that point. Um, we owe like 150 right now on our mortgage. So I like where that's at and I really don't want to move in house, but I'm, I'm just having a hard time kind of justifying that home equity loan, but it also seems like it might be logical. How much will the addition be, Tyler? Have, have you guys priced anything out? Well, we're thinking around seventy-five thousand. Okay. How much you guys make a year? About a hundred. Okay. Yeah. Well, we'll never, you know, be in the business to tell you to take a HELOC out to to do any type of renovation or addition on your home. Anything. Uh, anything ever. So to be able to save up and just cash flow this thing. Uh, is what yeah. the next option would, would Sounds look to like. me like you're about to overbuild your neighborhood. Not really. I mean, I, I'm a realtor as well in the area. Um, so, I mean, you know, it should add about $100,000 worth of value to our neighborhood. No, we got I, a few, few other properties in the neighborhood that have that. So your house is worth what now? About three fifty. Okay. And $450,000 customers always come on your street. Yeah, the last couple properties that sold were right at four hundred without uh, an ADU. Four hundred, yeah. You're about to be yeah, on the top that. of or overbuild your neighborhood with a weird, with a weird type of square footage. The square footage that you're yeah. adding has to be used for particular uses, versus a home of actual sure. square footage. I wouldn't do this from a real estate perspective. Okay. Even with you, you, ever, hey, you said you're a realtor. Think- have you ever shown a house with a mother-in-law apartment to people that didn't have a mother-in-law wanted to live in it? <laughs> yeah, 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 I do. Uh, it's, it's difficult. Yeah. 
I looked right. at I looked at one not long ago. I considered it, and we ruled it out because we were being charged price per square foot to include the mother in law apartment, and we're having to dream up how I turn it into a gun closet or something. Sure, you know, yeah. it just it didn't have good use, right? So mm-hmm. it's just because I, I I guarantee you, my mother in law is not moving in there. So that you know that's uh. You know, I, I, and I'm not definitely not running an Airbnb next door to me. No, I don't think it's good square footage. I don't think it's good investment, and I wouldn't use a HELOC. So I got about 73 reasons why I would not do this deal. I think you're jonesing for some extra square footage for your growing family. Yeah, I would look at it. And I think Tyler. that's a reasonable move. Yeah. And maybe moving up in house as long as the house payment is no more than a fourth of your take home pay on a 15 year fixed yeah. and move up in neighborhood, move up in square footage, move up in house. I'm not going to be in the top of the neighborhood with weird square footage. Because nowadays, even newer builds. I feel like, and I guess depending on where you are in the country, but I feel like even ones that we walked through, you know, a few years ago, the layout for families, you know, is different is different than it was, you know, in 2010. So I'm like, oh, different, so, definitely. You, so you can get maybe think, even what this, you I think want. The new, the new plans are much better. Yeah. So Tyler, I feel like you guys as a family, you talked about homeschool area, even an extra area for guests, like the way that that houses now are laid out. I feel like you guys could maybe get everything that you want by just moving up and home versus having to do this whole construction thing. And, and I'll be honest too. I think some of it, I would I would be as realistic as possible, Tyler, because if nobody is in that, the the percentage of you guys actually Airbnb it out is probably low. Like if you have kids and life is going on, you know, so like even the way that you guys are thinking about it, are there ways that another part or another type of home could scratch that itch another way versus building out this whole other part of your house? Chris is in Idaho Falls, Idaho. Hi, Chris. Welcome to the Ramsey Show. Hi, Dave. Thanks for having my call today. Sure. How can we help? So basically, I have a 401k from a previous employer, and it's just kind of sitting there. The career I'm at now doesn't offer the same benefits Mm -hmm. as before. Mm -hmm. And so it's kind of just been sitting for like the last six months or so, and I'm not sure what I should do with it. A hundred percent of the time that you leave a company, uh, we recommend you take your 401k with you by rolling it in a direct transfer rollover into a traditional IRA, picking out good mutual funds, growth, growth and income, aggressive growth and international, four categories evenly spaced, and do a direct transfer rollover. To help you do every bit of that, click SmartVestor at RamseySolutions.com. Find the brokers and uh, uh, financial folk in your area that we recommend that have the heart of a teacher and will walk you through that. But we take it with you, and here's the reasons we take it with you. You can choose from mutual funds, all over 8,000 mutual funds in the open market for your IRA. In your old 401k, you're stuck with a 12 or 8 or whatever number of options you had at the old company. So you have more options to pick better funds. You have more control over it, and you don't forget to manage it. When it's laying back there in some place in the past, people forget to look at it. And so those are the three reasons we tell you to take take it with you always. Direct transfer means you fill out the paperwork, the money goes straight into there. You do not take a check from the old place. If they send you a check, they have to withhold 20%, and you don't have 100% to do the rollover, and you're going to end up paying taxes on that other 20%. You don't have that other 20%. So do a 100% rollover, direct transfer. It goes directly from your old company into the IRA. Does not come to you. Get a Smart Vester Pro to help you pick all that out and get it working. It yeah. just gives you a lot more control. Yes. And this is a very common thing right now. I mean, the amount of people switching jobs and changing companies and everything, is it feels like at an all-time high. Uh, it's so much. So for a lot of you out there listening – and you have, and if you have left, go back and get that 401k if you didn't take it with you. Um, because yeah, it's, it, it, when it's front of mind, like you said, being able to manage it and actually look at it and feel emotion towards it and to know what to do, talking to a professional, all of it, it's yours, right? It's not just hanging back there in the past where your employer just keeps it. Exactly. Exactly. And don't roll it to your new employer if they do have a 401k. Because again, limited options, less control. You've got total control this way. There's no point in keeping it at the old place and no point in rolling it to the new place. So really good question, Chris. I'm glad you called us. Thank you. This is The Ramsey Show.
We've been doing business at Ramsey for more than 30 years. By now, we're a well-oiled machine, but it wasn't always that way. Yes, we've always had a vision, always had determination, and a drive to help people, but what we didn't have was one central place to access all our numbers so that we could get further ahead or quickly see when we needed to pivot. We were always jumping back and forth between different systems and spreadsheets. So when NetSuite by Oracle helped us wrangle our revenue, inventory, expenses, and more into one place, it was a game changer. And NetSuite's number one cloud financial system can help your business gain the same visibility because businesses thrive on timely data. And NetSuite's real-time analytics can help your business have immediate access to your numbers daily so you always know where you stand and you can move quickly. So go to netsuite.com slash Ramsey today and set up a free product tour. That's netsuite.com slash Ramsey. Thank you for joining us, America. Open phones at 888-825-5225. When we started this whole thing called Ramsey, the Dave Ramsey show was called The Money Game, and I had a co-host back in the day, had two co-hosts back in the day. Now I've got a bunch of co-hosts, um, different ones, obviously. But when we started this thing, the whole idea was learning how to handle money with common sense. Today, we talk about careers and mental health with common sense as well, relationships with common sense with Dr. Dr. D, Dr. John Deloney, and Ken Coleman. But the whole money thing was about how to handle money well to get control of our lives and become outrageously generous and wealthy and change our family tree. That has over 30 years. Um, we've ended up spending an inordinate amount of energy towards that end to become wealthy and generous to get people out of debt because that's the biggest blocker for them to become outrageously wealthy and outrageously generous. If you get out of debt, your most powerful wealth building tool is your income. If you invest a hundred dollars a month from age 25 to age 65 in a decent growth stock mutual fund, it will be $1,176,000. You retire a millionaire. 25 to 65, but you can't have a $750 F-150 payment. You can't have a student loan that's been around so long you think it's a pet, a master card, American distress, or discovered bondage. You can't just keep yourself in payments where all you do is work for the man. All you do is work for these stinking banks that have better furniture and bigger buildings than you do. And the reason is you gave them all your stinking money. And you have no money because you gave it all to them. And that has been what we've become known for because it's the single largest blocker for folks out there. And debt has been so normalized in our culture that to even imagine living without it is unbelievable. And... uh Article just handed to us by our producer yesterday, the New York Fed released its Q1 report on household debt includes a record high $17 trillion consumer debt balance in America today. So I'm, we're doing no good because, I mean, we're not even making a dent. Apparently, we're going to be in business forever. This is seventeen job security trillion dollars with persistent credit card debt and rising delinquency rates. It's where we're at, and it's it's wild that the, it says in here a typical first quarter sees credit card balances decline as people pay off what they spent over the holidays while trying to outgift their in laws. But for the first time ever, the New York Fed stated that tracking this for twenty years, this isn't the case this year. So for the first time, instead balances remained flat 
over Q1, suggesting that people aren't cutting back and are probably using credit cards to finance daily spending due to the to the rising cost of pretty much everything. And so it and, and I feel like this is where when when the inflation conversation started about 18 months ago here on this show the fear was that people were going to more than ever justify, take that margin that was there and now isn't there and continue to live a lifestyle and make up that difference with credit cards. Yeah. So but let, let's be real clear here. The debt is not because of inflation. The debt is because you're wussed out and refuse to cut your freaking lifestyle to offset inflation. Because you're still sitting in a line of 30 cars to buy an unbelievably expensive cup of coffee. And yet, I'm in debt because of inflation. No, you're in debt because you didn't cut your spending when inflation hit, hit. you. Yep. That's why you're in debt. So this is not an outside variable that is controlling your life. It's you not controlling the variables in your life. And so your butt ends up in well, debt. And what sucks is, you know, for a lot of people, though, it's not this outrageous lifestyle that they're living. You know, that there's two incomes. They have kids. They have family. Like, they are living life, the quote-unquote American standard of living that, again, you can we can argue the standard of living of what it is, but... What, what's difficult is when you have to go backwards. Nobody likes to go backwards. That's why, well, sacri- that's why it sacrificing. It doesn't feel outrageous because it felt normal. That's yes. But and so, when you actually consider the way we all live, yes. it's outrageous. Well, Our agree. lifestyles you, are outrageous. Well, you look at the standard, you know, the, the square, the average square we footage. We spend more on uh, can, pets. Uh, can I, can I, can I? Yeah. Can I get a word in? I don't know. Can you? So, well, ba- barely, barely. But no, but you look at the average square footage in the 70s now, average mm-hmm. car, average vacations. I mean, you look at all of it and it has. The American lifestyle has gone up. Mm-hmm. And so our expectations on what is normal is here. And so for families that are living paycheck to paycheck that are doing this and sure, because, you know, you have a $600 car loan, like there, there is still debt in the picture that is causing less margin. But when something like inflation hits and eggs and bacon, everything goes up and your grocery bill is like, what? And fit to fill up your car, you're looking at the gas and you're like, what? That's st- in, in the moment, like that does hurt because there's not the margin for that extra hundred, extra 200, extra $300 that now is going out on normal expenses. So, so to cut back, which I agree with you, but it feels like, but I, what, what am I supposed to cut back to? Because because well, we've normalized outrageous. where I'm where I am. Yeah, we've you know? normalized outrageous. Yes, we become exp- we became uh, entitled to outrageous, and so I'm entitled to this, and and so you know inflation then forced me to go into debt, which is absolute hogwash. You just did not. I mean, all all it is is you have to address. You have to look in the mirror and go, we just buy some really stupid stuff. I mean, we really buy some stupid stuff. Most people in most countries could exist for a year off of the crap that's in your garage that you've not even seen in a year. You know, I mean, we buy some stupid stuff. So, yes, it's normalized. It doesn't feel outrageous, but it is outrageous. So I I always resist when bank rates, senior industry and analyst says uh, suggesting that people aren't cutting back and using credit cards is it's because of the rising cost of inflation. No, they're not cutting back to offset inflation, duper. That's what's really going on. And so. You know, and I get it. I, I, it's not fair. I don't like inflation. I don't want that to take your check away from you. But don't be a victim. You're not a victim. You're a victim of the person in your mirror. And the idea, here's, a, here's another plan. If you think getting into debt to maintain your lifestyle is going to maintain your lifestyle, there's an end to that. Mm-hmm. There, there's a mathematical end to that. It eventually comes and buy, it's a boomerang. comes back around, smacks you in the head and says, hey, dummy. So yeah, I think it is for, not so a for good thing. families out there, though, because I mean, I was sitting down with a family. They made eighty thousand, and you look at, you look at month to month after taxes, you know, and you're looking, and you're like, okay, like uh, everything on their budget was not unreasonable, right? I'm like, it's in a fam- our current it's a, world, it's a family of five, and it's like, yeah, this is what a Costco, this is what it takes to feed the family. This is what you know. And granted, the kids are doing a sport. Like I mean, like it, it's life. It's just it is life, and life is expensive, and so. 
families out there that are listening, it's like if you when you're feeling that pressure that you felt even before inflation and then add some of this on here where life got even more expensive, you have to evaluate needs versus wants. And this is where we've blended so much that our what we want has become a need. And so being able to prioritize and really look and it's and it's hard, but it's like, okay, what really are our needs? And we talk about the four walls, food, shelter, utilities and transportation. And then under that, there has to be a priority because in order for you to sleep at night and to actually have peace and control your money is so much worth it than some of this other stuff that's in your budget. And so cutting some of that for the time being is probably a reality to help you get on the other side of this. It doesn't have to be forever, but depending on the credit card and and functioning in that cycle of I'll just use the credit card to, to offset this stuff, it gets you into more trouble and less peace. You're killing yourself. Yep killing yourself. Dad is not your answer. This is The Ramsey Show. Buying a home is one of the biggest decisions of your life. You need a partner like Churchill Mortgage. Churchill is one of the highest rated lenders in the country and they're Ramsey trusted because they do what's right for you. Churchill works with you to build a mortgage the Ramsey way. One that doesn't bust your budget, sets you up for financial success and helps you get out of debt faster. Go to churchillmortgage.com today and get started. Ramsey personality is my co-host today. Thank you for joining us, America. We're so glad you're here. If you haven't heard, over 10 million people have now gone through Financial Peace University. It is the most concise, clear way to execute the wealth building steps that we have proven, not only getting out of debt and getting on a budget, but learning about insurance, learning about real estate, executing on all the different pieces and nuances of what we teach. And you hear you hear bits and pieces of it here on the radio. Sometimes you see a YouTube clip and, well, Dave, I can get all your stuff out there for free. You could have got it all for free before I did it. It's called common sense. But the point is, the best thing we do around here with money is Financial Peace University. And we show you very clearly how to not only what the lessons are, the nine lessons, but we also are going to walk with you with a coordinator, someone to be in virtual or in person with you and a group of people to hold you accountable and to encourage you when you're scared and struggling. And uh, we're doing Financial Peace University right now with coordinators on, on virtual, in addition to thousands of locations, right this second. And all the Ramsey personalities are coordinating. Rachel, your class is shut off because you're like in the week three, right? I know. I just had my class right before I came on the air with you. Oh, yeah. Today. So, yeah, we are. We just finished lesson four. No, so you're halfway so, through. So, yep, we're halfway through. Okay, cool. Yep. Very cool. And Jade, her class is shut down because she's at the same point same you as are. Me. Yep. Hers is at her night. Seat. But Dr. John Deloney, Ken Coleman, George Camel, Eddie Cullen all have their classes still open. I think and John starts Monday, I oh, heard. Oh, yep. So his is coming up. Yep. Better get in there. So go FPU.com or RamseySolutions.com and go, go to the FPU pages and jump into the Ramsey personality. If you're watching on YouTube, there's a little QR code. You guys stick that back up there if you can, so people can get that QR code and jump right straight to the page. And yeah, fpu.com and take Ramsey, take it with a Ramsey personality if you'd like right now. They'll hold you accountable, and every dollar is included. Access to a coach is included. You do the whole puppy, and you're just you. It's the fastest way you can get control of this stuff. It's not easy. We're never going to make it easy because it's just not easy. It's hard. It's life change. But it is worth it, and this process works. Abby is in Dallas. Hi, Abby. Welcome to The Ramsey Show. Hi. Thank you so much for taking my call. Sure. What's up? 
So my husband and I are in baby steps four, five, and six, um, nothing, no debt except for our mortgage. And we were wondering if it would be okay to pause investing for one, maybe two months while we cash flow an HVAC replacement. How much is the replacement? 11000 Okay. How much do you guys make a year? Um, so our take-home pay per month is usually about twenty thousand. Um, next month it's probably going to be about sixteen thousand because I'm going to be going on maternity leave, so it's going to go down a little bit. Oh well, congratulations, Abby. So baby soon. Well, you Thank better. You. you definitely need an air conditioner. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's pretty much where we're coming from. I'm actually three days overdue right now. Oh my so gosh! And the AC and the AC's out in Dallas. Is it out, or you just need well, a new one? So- so that's the thing. It's not out, but every time it hits 90 or 100 here, it goes out. Uh, we had it repaired about 10 times over the last 12 months, and we figure with a yeah. newborn and we have a one-year-old as well, we don't want – I mean, it's Dallas. It's going to hit 90 or 100 in the next six weeks for yeah. sure, and we just want to get it taken care of. For sure. Listen, I completely agree that you need an air conditioner with a brand-new baby, and I completely understand when you're two days overdue – why this is a big deal, but you're going about it completely the wrong way. I'm okay. going to love you enough to tell you that. You can fix Thank this you. thing one more time and take two months and save five or $6,000 a month or three months and save $3,000 a month out of your $20,000, $16,000 income, and you can pay cash for this without stopping your investments. All right. That's what I thought you were going to say. I just wanted to double check. Do you all have, Abby, do you have an emergency fund? Yeah, we do, but we don't really consider it. I mean, it doesn't qualify as an emergency, right? We know. Yeah, that but I'm just saying. If it, well, go, if it, go, if it goes if it, out, though, if it Abby, lays like, down and cannot be yeah, revived, then you if can, they bring out the paddles, clear, boom, and they can't revive it, right? <laughs> then, then use then, the emergency yeah, fund. Yeah, now it's, you, an, now it's an emergency. Or even, Abby, if you, I mean, like, again, depending on, and that, this is your call, but if you don't feel like, in, like you're going to need it sooner than three months for some reason you could take a couple thousand out of the emergency fund with money you've saved do it quick you know what i'm saying like you can shuffle things around uh you have that emergency fund there so because how I, big is your emergency fund uh thirty thousand okay so if you took 11 out today you'd have 19 yeah it's not an emergency yeah. so i wouldn't do that okay yeah. but this is your fallback yeah, if something so, were to happen. I'm going to let it, I'm, I'm with Rachel, I'm going to let it limp along, my original suggestion, pile as much out of saving, out of my income as I can, and if this thing gets weird, you have a brand new baby, it's it becomes an emergency. If it becomes an emergency, then you use part of the emergency. Let's say you'd save $5,000, well, you take six out of the emergency fund, two months later, you've put that back, right? Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so you don't need to be... Pausing retirement for that. You don't have to be pausing retirement, number one. But number two, you don't need to be worried as a mom of a newborn that we're going to be in jeopardy somehow. We need to. There's no anxiety yeah. around that because you're going to fake, you're going to have heating and air. It's just a matter of how we go about it, whether we cash the emergency fund out or whether we save all the way through or whether we save part of the way through. And so by September, you're going to have a new heating and air. That's the way I would look at it if I were you. Because I'm, I'm just saying, this is super valid in your situation. I mean, you're not in Minnesota. You're in Texas. <laughs> yes, it went out several times last summer when I had a three-month-old baby, and that was super fun. Oh. It 82 degrees in the house. Ours went out. We had no money. Rachel was a brand-new baby. We bought box fans, those little cheap-butt fans down at Walmart, because we didn't have the money to fix it. So we survived. But, boy, that was miserable. And i got to tell you, it, it was 30-something years ago. I'm and my scarred. wife, my wife to this day is really... Yeah, those are scars that last. So I'm 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 gonna be on your side. The former me didn't do a good job with that. So I would have been pissed if I was mom and that was you. Do what now? I don't know. You would have been I pissed. Could just, yeah. I could just see Dave thirty years ago. Sharon, suck it up. Get some fans. And I would have been like, <laughs> That's what we did. I'm gonna absolutely. That's what we did. <laughs> But she's not a whiner, so she never really had to suck it up. She's just like, yeah, this is what we got to do. But it really, really, really is pissing me <laughs> off. Yeah, And I'm really going to remind you for the next 35 years that we did this. You know? So but that that's fair. That's fair. I mean, I've, you yeah. know, 
But you can get those little box fan things done. Oh, don't they're stop They're like twelve dollars. Just stop it. They're like like two speed, right? They're twelve dollars. Stop it. You know, but man, Dallas is miserable in the heat. Oh God, the only thing it's worse would be in being in Phoenix, right? Well, at least Phoenix is dry heat. Yeah, that, yeah, like sticking your head in an <laughs> oven, dry heat. Yeah, I love it when we go to Phoenix and they go, "It's a hundred and ten, but it's dry heat." And I'm going, "There's an egg on the sidewalk frying over there, buddy." Okay, but yeah. <laughs> At least you can breathe in it. Tennessee and Dallas is tough. I love all of them. They're great. Both mm. great cities. Mm. Both great cities. It's fun. Hey, guys, so the point being, you know, when when you're broke, you don't have those options. She's got the emergency fund. Wouldn't it be horrible oh, God. to be in that situation and have no money? Yeah. Because then she'd be calling up going, we need to borrow money mm -hmm. for a heating and air. And then I do remember when I finally got to the other side of that. And we were at the the first house we had over here in Brentwood, the one mm -hmm. you grew up in. And that heating and air went out. And uh, I remember, I, I it's weird, I remember, this a long time ago, it was in yeah. the 80s. But I remember the, it was $3,418 to put a new unit on. I still remember the number. Mm. Because we had the money. And you could do it. And yeah. I could just pull it out. And it was like, this is the weirdest feeling. This is not an emergency. It's an inconvenience. Yep, yep. And now I've just got to put 3400 bucks back in there. Because we're just, you know, because we were literally, the thing had laid down. Yes. We, we were frying in the house. Same stuff. But uh, it was, um, it would have been, you know, six or eight years after the bankruptcy now. Yeah. And the, the year we're talking about with the box fans is the bankruptcy year, the year you were born. So, wow. Imagine Rachel, little baby, crying, oh, screaming. It's just terrible. It's hot. Just terrible. Scre Can you imagine Rachel screaming, y'all? <laughs> Can y'all remember that? This is the Ramsey Show. Rachel Cruz, Ramsey personality, is my co-host today. Thank you for joining us, America. Open phones at 888-825-5225. Lindsay is in Colorado Springs. Hi, Lindsay. Welcome to the Ramsey Show. Hi, Dave and Rachel. Hey, what's up? So my husband and I are looking for your guidance related to the costs that we're paying to our financial advisor for managing our growing retirement portfolio. How much are you we paying them? find out. Um, well, we're, we've, we've had a lot of conversations related to this. Um, so we're at 0.87% yearly, but when we look at the impact of a growing portfolio and compounding interest, we're not, we're wanting to make sure that we're being good stewards and that there's value for those fees. That's a normal managed fund uh, uh, or managed amount for a million dollar account. So, so that, as it grows above a million dollars, you end up... I mean, it, it should be it should be dissipated. It should be going down. Um, I mean, if you want to shop it around, but th they're not ripping you off. That's that's a fairly standard yeah. way. Managed accounts are how almost all brokers are handling it now. They used to sell mutual funds on commission, and and now they just plump them in there and manage the whole thing on a managed account. Uh, I would say ninety something percent of our smart investor pros use that exact system. Uh, now, it, could it be that, you know, I, what's the size of your portfolio? Million, you said? Oh, it's only 500000 right now. Oh, you're we fine. we still have 20 working years. And yeah, so we were just looking at, you know, what would Dave say? You've obviously got, you know, a, a multi-million dollar portfolio. Like, yeah. are we doing the best we should? Do we get the value? Is there, you know, do you want to have that managed or is there a better way to do it? Yeah, most... Uh uh, most of our Ramsey personalities, most of the people in the building are doing that with one of our smart investor pros exactly that way. My personal portfolio was set up before that stuff came on and it's old school. And so, and I don't ever buy or sell. I just buy and hold. So there's not a lot of management to it. So I've mm -hmm. never moved it 
personally into that, but it's not because it's a ripoff. It's not because we hate it. It's not that at all. It's just mine was antiquated, and I just there's no point in doing it because I don't do anything with it. It just sits there. So, but I I think that you know again, the at most of the folks in this building a George Camel. I suspect a Rachel Me. Cruz. I yeah. don't know. Mm-hmm. Those kinds of folks are they're they're paying a managed fee with our, one of our Smart Vester Pros, and it's probably right at about that same amount. Now it is fair. For you to ask what the flip they're doing to earn that, you know, it's mm-hmm. fair to go. Okay, if if you are you just sitting here looking at it and it just not. I mean, what are we getting for our one <laughs> percent? You know, that's a fair sure. question. It's not like you I, and I don't suggest you do a bunch of buying and selling. So you know, I don't want there to. I I really big on just buying and keeping it unless there's a real reason to get out of the fund. Lin- Lindsay, the the person managing it for you guys, just do they sit down and look at your entire financial picture at all? Like, is that or is it just specifically just investing? Because our Smart Vester Pro, I mean, we sit down, we look at pr- basically everything, which is just so helpful. Mm-hmm. Like, that's one reason I love having somebody. We sit down every January. And it's everything from investing to looking at kids' college to even giving purposes of stuff that they – like, they just mm-hmm. know that world. Some, some estate planning. Yeah, they just um, – I mean, In it's, your case, actually, your guy called out a really good capital thing, capital gains thing on a piece of real estate that y'all Yeah, we had our, our house when we moved. Yeah. We kept it for a rental, but then we were going to sell it, and it was a capital gains thing. So, yeah, he just, like, gave us information, and I was like, oh, yeah, that's right. Okay. So it's just having somebody in your corner. So you don't have that, but you have – but you have estate planning with attorneys. I yeah, mean, all that stuff. Got a, but I'm saying you massive. have you have people in your corner. Uh, well, I've got him in my corner. I mean, I just don't pay him a monthly fee. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I don't yeah, pay yeah. him an annual fee because I bought the funds and paid the commissions up front. A, right. share, a shares. Right. They're called. And so uh, and I've already paid the deal and it's just sitting there. And again, I haven't sold a mutual fund in probably 20 years. I just buy them. You know, I just I, my, my, I have no activity on my account at all except purchases. So it's just not a thing. So, But I, I think it's a great conversation, and I would sit down. I will tell you that the vast majority of quality uh, financial planner types, broker types, at financial advice, people managing, helping you with your retirement accounts, those kinds of things, are set up on exactly that plan. There's a few people that still do only A shares. Uh, a lot of people will only do that plan now because of, of liability that they take on under the federal ERISA rules and so forth if they don't do that plan. But uh, but I, I it is a great conversation to have and say, why are you worth 1%? Why would I not just buy this on my own and not give you 0.87 or 1 or whatever it is, right? But mm-hmm. but you're not out of line. You're not getting ripped off. I wouldn't be panicking about it. But you're very wise to start at to be always asking these questions. A, you need to understand your investments, and B, you don't need to understand anything you're being charged and what are you getting for what you're being charged. I think those are wonderful. Now I will tell you this, everybody out there, not ju- not you, Lindsay, because I don't think that's going on with you. But there again. There's these all there's these little nuanced pieces of research studies that are done. The people that do not have a broker like that in their corner are unbelievably more likely to pull their money out every time there's bad news and to put pull their money at exactly the wrong time and buy at exactly the wrong time, trying to time the market. So if you never pull your money out, it's worth 0.87 just to keep you from jumping off the cliff, just <laughs> to talk you off the point. ledge, mm-hmm. just to talk you off the ledge because you're having a broker in your corner goes, don't do that. Here's the historical data. Here's what happens. And, you know, every year following a two year downturn, except one since the 1930s, we've seen a huge uptick. We've had two down years. We're going to see a huge uptick historically coming up. Most people don't know that. But if you've studied the charts and you know what the mutual fund returns are and you know what stock market returns are, you know that and you're a broker and you're advising people, you can talk them off the ledge and go, you're getting ready to get out at exactly the wrong time. I know it's been flat. I know it's been sucky. We, you know, we're in an inflationary Biden economy. It's horrible out there. Life's not good. I get that. But just hang on. The sun is going to come up tomorrow. And they talk you off that ledge and you're getting ready to 
bail at exactly the wrong time. Yep. And, and so that, that having that broker in your corner to bounce stuff off of or occasionally bring you Take something. Take the emotion out of it. Yeah. Yeah. Bring you a different idea or a different way of looking at something. Not constantly buying and selling the account, though. Now that you, we don't want to do that, mm-hmm. but just to just to have somebody there that's walking with you and the, you know, got your best interest at heart, because they make money only when you do, um, and and you know that that's if the thing if the whole thing goes down in value, they make less. So that that's not a bad way to to incentivize them, but you know it's it is a great thing. Back to her original point. To ask and yep. to understand, always know why you're being charged and what you're getting for what you're being charged. Love it. Good stuff. So, yeah, the um, diver- being diversified, spreading your portions to seven, yes to eight, not having all your money in one stock, not buying and selling. Hold on. No one gets hurt on a roller coaster except those that jump off in the middle of the ride. Having someone in your corner like a Smart Investor Pro to teach you, to meet with you, to review your stuff, uh, making sure. And here's the key. Always have somebody with the heart of a teacher always have someone that's where you know what's going on yeah because there are i mean like any industry in every industry there's good people and there's bad people and so you're gonna feel yep. like oh i don't feel right with this person i don't really like them i don't uh, you know if you get that feeling then don't use them so right, right. and i feel like that sometimes this industry can be slime like i feel like the stereotype sometimes it's like oh i don't want to use someone because i don't want to pay them and they're going to try to they're going to try to get me there's, like there's plenty of good ones yes yes there's more good ones than bad ones yes but if they got the heart of a salesman you'll feel like you need a shower after you met with them right and so no that's not you're looking Gross. for someone with the heart of a mm-hmm. teacher someone to walk you through teach you teach you and you'll know they have the heart of a teacher if you learn something every time you meet with them you should know something more than you knew before Every time you meet with them, they're a teacher then. And they're wanting you to understand your own stuff because you're responsible for it, not them. My man lost all my money. No, you lost all your money because you trusted a goober. It's your fault. You didn't understand what was going on. This is The Ramsey Show. Hey, it's Rachel Cruz. If you like what you heard in this episode and want to know more about getting started on the Ramsey baby steps, go to RamseySolutions.com and click the get started button. We'll help you figure out the best next step for you based on your specific situation. That's RamseySolutions.com and click get started. Live from the headquarters of Ramsey Solutions, broadcasting from the pods, moving and storage studios, it's the Ramsey Show, where we help people build wealth, do work that they love, and create actual amazing relationships. Rachel Cruz, Ramsey personality, number one best-selling author, host, co-host of the Smart Money Happy Hour, an exceedingly popular podcast on Ramsey Networks with George Camel. Be sure you check it out. She's my co-host today. The phone number is 888 825 Sarah's in Hartford, Connecticut. Hi, Sarah. Welcome to the Ramsey Show. Hi, Dave. Hi, Rachel. Thanks so much for taking my call. Sure. What's up? So I'm hoping you can settle a disagreement between me and my husband. I'm 26. He's 30. We have a household income of around $140,000. Um, our net worth is two fifty. dollars um, We've never um, carried debt except for our mortgage. The problem is that I've been feeling super underutilized and unfulfilled at work and have asked for more work, more projects, and kind of concluded that this field may just not be for me. Um, So I've dreamed of going to law school, so it would be part-time and in the evening. But my husband thinks that giving up the stability and the growth trajectory of our current situation to cash flow it would set us back greatly and is just not worth it. And I'm just looking for insight on that or what you think. Uh, what do you do now, Sarah? What kind of line, what kind of field are you working in? I'm a public librarian. Okay. Uh, and how much would it take for you to get a law degree? Have you priced anything out? 
Yep. It would be $88,000 over four years since I'd be doing it part-time. Okay. So, you, okay. So 22 a year yep. to cash flow it. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. oh, what are you making now as a librarian? Um, How much I'm of that 140 is yours? 65. 65 for my full time um, with projected increases of 9% over the next two years. Okay. Okay. This is the the math of his uh, proposal or his concern is not logical unless he believes you're not going to use the law degree. Mm. Do you think he thinks you're not going to follow through and be a lawyer? Like, I mean, if you, um, if you have two kids, are you going to quit and go home? No, I think he probably thinks that the money wouldn't be so much more, considering I could probably go up to 90 in the next few years. Well, over the scope of job. your life, a lawyer makes more than a librarian. Hello. That's not hard. Right. That's kind of, yeah, yeah. Of, course it's, of course it's worth 88000 the return on investment of 88000 if you work as a lawyer the rest of your life and do a decent to a really, really good job, you should make six figures, not 90. And, uh, and I mean, you can. There's plenty of lawyers don't make any money, but they're horrible lawyers, and they don't manage their practice well, and they don't, you know, they manage their career fast. Or they're work. in the public sector. I mean, yeah. yeah. Or, or they stay in the, they work yeah. for the state or something, right. you know. But, you know, you, you, can, you can get a law degree and not maximize it, but... And that's such a broad um, so, I mean, field, anyway. Sarah, do you ha- do you do you yeah. have a do you have a passion about a specific type of law that you're like I really yeah. want to do that, or is it kind of just this broad like law school just sounds great? Yeah, it would be human rights. That's kind of what I've, I've always wanted to go into. I've applied mm-hmm. to, for law librarian positions and I've gotten pretty far, so I've kind of been close to that, but it's just hasn't worked out. Yeah, my first my first reaction when I hear that category is you're going to do a lot of pro bono work and you're not going to make any money. Sounds more like a crusader yeah. than a lawyer. <laughs> Did I miss something? No, no, I think which is not wrong. That's, that's I mean, it's not a bad. That, that doesn't make you wrong. a bad person. That, it makes wrong. you excellent, but yeah. it does it does justify your husband's position. Yeah. Because if you go in that type of law and you're, you know, you're working on crusades all the time, which are great. Mm-hmm. I mean, human rights, I can't think of anything better. But, uh, uh, you know, you're protecting other people. You're using your knowledge and your, your, the tools in your belt to fight for the uh, un- injustices in the world. That's wonderful. But, but you know, I, unless I'm missing something, I don't think that's a big paying side of the law. Yeah. And then, then he starts to be right. Yeah, but unless you guys decided as well that, yeah, we're going to sacrifice our lifestyle and we're going to cash flow this, obviously, we'd, we'd say that regardless. Um, mm-hmm. But in what you're wanting to do with your life. Yeah, he says it's not worth it, money-wise, is what he said. I know, but then a part of me is like, yeah, but, I mean, if you can pay for it and that's what you want to do, that's your line of work. I mean, unless you can get about that same passion a different door than just having a law degree – but I just, I, I mean, I've, you know, we work with a lot of nonprofits and I can think of two examples right now where people have traveled internationally out of, you know, uh, you know, persecuting sex traffickers and they're, and they're putting laws Pro- in place. Prosecuting. Prosecute. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> and, we should persecute them sorry, too, but that, prosecute them. All the yeah. above. All the above. No, but, but I'm saying like, there's such good work in that. And a part of me is like not mad if you guys decide, hey, I'm going to cash flow a degree to be able to. To use I'm okay with that, that. But, but then, you know, but the way you presented this, it was more like he wasn't supporting his wife's dream. Uh, and he, and all he's challenging is the financials on the dream. Yes. And so that's... So it comes uh, back to a values question. Yeah, it, it comes down to, do you guys want to spend the money for a break even? Because you want to be in this field. Yeah. Yeah, that's fine. Or is there another way to go in that field if you that's wanna, not if you want to practice a, a more... If you want to practice a uh, a higher compensated type of law with your law degree, then uh, it becomes a no-brainer financially for you to go get the law degree, okay? But, yeah, it, this is a really good, healthy discussion for you guys to have because what you're – you know, if he comes to agreement on this, he's agreeing to support your passions in spite of the math, and that that's what he's yeah. doing. And and all he's saying right now is the math doesn't work. And but if if you want to do it in spite of the math, 
I, I, I'm okay with that. Yeah. That, that's okay. And again, Sarah, I would really, I would, uh, I would just challenge you to say, Hey, what type of human rights am I, it, do I feel called to, do I feel like pulled to and go and work with people in that sector? I mean, like I, I would, I would get in there and just like experience all of it because sometimes like any, any job, any career, any passion, anything, it can seem one way, right? Mm-hmm. Kind of glamorous. Mm-hmm. And then once you get in there, you're like, oh man, I don't know if if this is what I want to do full yeah, time. I might, right? take, so, I might take my vacation time and intern yep. in a human rights law firm that's spending their time on, on these causes and for the summer and see how it feels. Yep. Yeah. That would be a Ken Coleman type of a suggestion Rachel just made, and that's a good one. Or a Rachel Cruz suggestion that Rachel Cruz just made. Oh, well, there, oh, there's that. Oh, there's, there's that, that too. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah. Ken Coleman in my head. <laughs> I did say quick. I did quick, say persecute him versus out. prosecute. So quick, get him out. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you're persecuted right now. I know. I, I did. <laughs> Man, I had such a good point. I screwed up words. Words are hard. Uh, <laughs> mm. That's okay. Mm. I mess up and mix metaphors. Uh, yes, you it's do. a family trait. <laughs> it's a family trait. This is the Ramsey Show. <laughs> Rachel Cruz, Ramsey personality, is with me as a co-host today. Open phones at 888-825-5225. Our question of the day comes from Neighborly. The Ramsey Show question of the day is sponsored by your hub for home services. Take your home's efficiency and style to the next level with convenient solutions from Shelf Genie, Window Genie, Glass Doctor, and Mr. Appliance. Visit neighborly.com, and you can schedule all these different kinds of home services and professionals. They'll help you out. Today's question comes from Catherine in Wisconsin. What do you usually use as a guideline for a buffer in your checking account? Is this different from the miscellaneous line item on the budget? Uh, Yes, that is different. So having a zero-based budget does not mean a zero balance in your checking accounts. Thank so God. keep uh, keep a buffer there because stuff is going to come up and you just want to be able to make sure that you're not, you know, dipping into the red in your checking and getting hit with those fees and penalties and everything. So um, yeah, having just a, a buffer, we don't really give a specific dollar amount or percentage. It's really going to depend on your income and where you feel comfortable, but just making sure, yeah, you don't go in the red, but then your miscellaneous category is a different, that's in your budget. Um, with the income that you have to be able to say, hey, stuff is going to come up realistically. And when things do come up that we didn't plan for, it doesn't completely whack out our budget, right? We still have a zero base budget. So that miscellaneous category is very crucial because whew, stuff always comes up that you just don't even think about. Yeah. Miscellaneous is completely separate, as Rachel said. And I would say your buffer in your checking needs to be well under a thousand unless you're above baby step three. If you're getting out of debt and building your emergency fund, any money that approaches a thousand dollars ought to be in savings towards a, or, or in your debt. You know, moving on, you don't need a like a two thousand dollar buffer in your savings in your checking account while you're trying to get out of debt. So keep it under a grand until you're out of north of baby step three. Um, you know, somewhere maybe. I, you, again, based on your income and what's going on, how much money's flowing through the account, what a mistake would look like those kinds of things. But it does not mean zero based budget means every dollar that is coming in has an assignment. And that's of your income, not every dollar in your checking account. They're two different things. Kim is in Los Angeles. Hi, Kim. How are you? Hi, I'm very blessed. Thank you. How are you? Better than I deserve. What's up? Well, thank you for taking my call. 
Um, my husband and I have started this a lot later than we thought we uh, would or should. Um, we've been getting the last 20 years of our life. We've kind of been scraping by on God's grace. Um, and finally, in this last year, we are on two incomes. Um, and then now that we're starting this, we find ourselves, I guess, between baby steps, maybe we can say. Um, so the question is, uh, can we cash out my 401k to get our house to what we feel we need it to be for our growing family um, and then restart our long-term investment? How old are you? Since we can't move. Um, 43. Okay. Well, if you did that, you would get a 10% penalty yes. and your tax rate. And uh, what's your household income? Uh, about 135. Okay. And so just it's about 40% will go to the government of everything you take out. And so that's kind of like saying, Dave, I want to borrow money at 40% interest to fix up my house. Mm. That'd be dumb. Okay. Follow that? Mm-hmm. Yeah, you wouldn't, you wouldn't borrow money at 40%, would you? No. <laughs> no. I hope not. Okay. You're, you're not that girl. I know you're not. Kim, what baby steps are you guys, yeah. when you said I'm in between, what what are those? Um, well, we have like 15000 in saving, yet I have about 10000 with debt, but then we have the 401k, about 50000 there. Okay. Well, you're not doing the baby steps. You're doing your plan. Okay. So, yeah, we just started. Okay. When I was looking, I was trying to figure out what to do first. Ah, okay. And how much will the home repairs be? About the 50. Okay. And you said you're, uh, so you don't have enough anyway, even if you wanted to do it, because you got the penalties and the interest. Um, right. Penalties and taxes. Okay, yeah. So uh, anyway, but the, um, so, so 50,000 worth of repairs and you've got uh, 15,000 in savings and you've got how much in debt? Ten. Okay, and minus ten. Okay, and you you said your household was one thirty. Mm-hmm. Okay. All right. What are the nature of the repairs? Um, I have a um, um, a boy girl siblings that are sharing a room right now. The older the boy is thirteen, and the little one's four. And I want to. Um, we're gonna put up a room, like separate a different room, so that they can have two separate rooms. And then we also don't have central air or heating. Mm, okay. And then mm. we also don't have, our house didn't come with a garage, so we need some sort of storage. Okay. I, I can tell you what Sharon and I did when we were at your stage. We mm-hmm. sold our house and rented. Oh. And um, that, got us that. Out, that got us out of debt. And um, we rented for two years. And we actually hated the rental house. My wife really mm-hmm. hated it, but um, but but it it gave us more space. And in our case, we, it was a school district thing. Got us into the right school district and saved us a bunch of money that way. In your case, it might just give you a bedroom and a garage, and uh, mm-hmm. and and you're debt free, and you build your emergency fund, and then you start saving up to repurchase a home that does fit later. Because I think this house might be left over from a different stage of your life. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was. Yeah. Like, but we have a 2.9% interest right now. Oh, well. Oh, well. Doesn't matter. You, you don't have $50,000 okay. $50, and you got a situation that's untenable for your family. Right. So I, I honestly... Yeah, we were thinking of moving, but it's just the, yeah. the house are so big right now, it's just we can't afford to move, so... Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you're okay. in Los Angeles. And we didn't even think of that. Yeah, yeah I, we didn't even I, think I, of that. I, I, I might do that. And here's what I want to do. I want to put the two of you through Financial Peace University so you can learn the baby steps and do this. So baby step one's mm-hmm. $1,000. We want you to do that first. You got that saved. Two is debt-free, yeah. but other than mm-hmm. the home. Three is to build an emergency fund of three to six months of expenses. So what that would lead us to do, if you were following that, would be to take enough out of your 15000 pay off your $10,000 in debt today. You're debt-free, but the house leaves you 5000 and then you build that emergency fund up from five to three to six months of expenses. You're not putting anything into retirement while you're doing that. And, and what I was reaching for early in the call was uh, on the 50000 if you do want to stay, it's uh, the way we've always worked it at our house and we teach people to work it is it's not a no, it's not a no, it's a not yet. 
We can't mm-hmm. do it today, but we could do it mm-hmm. making 130000 yeah, After we do these other steps, we could do it out there. It might be three years. And even logistically, Kim, you said that there is there another room in the house? Oh, it was, it's like a living room that we were going to separate. Okay, okay, okay. I got you. So it would take some... Yeah, but it's not a fifty thousand dollar renovation. Doesn't have to be. You're that's a big number to put up a wall. Yeah, we were just figuring while we're doing that, we'll do the uh-huh. AC also. But you know, yeah, we'll, we'll do the AC. Yeah, we'll so even so kitchen, even look yeah. at doing one at a time, and that yeah. may even be yeah. Just you know, that may even take some. Even if you guys don't want to move, right? Maybe moving yeah. moving is right. an option, or just hey, how long would this take us one to cash flow time. this? Yeah. Um, what, what's the priority for me? Yeah. It's for me. It's probably the bedroom, and then number two is HVAC, and number three is whatever else you hadn't mentioned yet that's in that fifty k. Because you mm-hmm. still hadn't gotten to fifty k with HVAC in a bedroom. Garage. Mm-hmm. Oh, Correct. You're gonna add a garage. A garage oh, yeah. there it is. Okay, that one's way down the list. All so right. Maybe so. it's a storage unit. Yeah. For a little bit. Or maybe we sell some or sell stuff, stuff. or, yeah, or sell stuff. That, that kind. Of, I mean, you just got to begin help. to work this through. But yeah, I'm. Hate to disappoint you, but that 50K is really not accessible uh, without giving up 40% of it. So I wouldn't do that under any circumstances. Only uh, The only circumstances to avoid a bankruptcy or a foreclosure, and that's not really on your situation. You're just tired of fighting this and not winning. So hang on. Austin's going to pick up. We're going to put you through Financial Peace University so you can learn how to do this stuff. You and your husband together do it. It's going to change everything. This is The Ramsey Show. those of you listening live or close to live tomorrow would be thursday the 18th we will be doing some stuff with fox tomorrow i'll be on the fox and friends in the morning in the seven o'clock hour central time uh and rachel's leaving uh and dr john deloney and ken coleman jade and jade jade warshaw are flight leaving first thing in the morning fly up and they are doing a town hall with fox business at noon Central Time, uh, taking questions from the audience uh, about inflation, about debt, credit card debt, student loan debt, all the things that are going on out there. And so the three of them will be part of that town hall at noon Central Time on Fox Business Thursday, the 18th. For those of you listening live, is tomorrow live or tomorrow. So, hey, thanks for joining us. Charles is with us. Charles is in Phoenix, Arizona. Hi, Charles. How are you? Hey, Dave, Rachel, I'm good. How are you? Better than we deserve. What's up? I was calling because I'm having a bit of trouble over the last two years. My question is, how can I work towards budgeting with my wife? We've been married for two years. I was working on the baby steps before marriage. We got married. And anything Dave Ramsey or Dave Ramsey personality, my wife despises, not to just reality of it. And um, anything, anytime I bring up the budget or talking through the budget or sticking to the budget, um, it's like scratching nails on a chalkboard to her. So well, since, just, she, since Rachel and I are so lovable, if she despises <laughs> us, that would be your fault. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> well, for, for the record, she didn't like you before she married me. <laughs> well, then you got yourself into this. I don't think I can help you. <laughs> I'm nicer, Charles. Maybe she'll like me. So, Tara, uh, follow me on Instagram. So, no, you're a Ramsey personality. He already said that. No, I know. But I just, but too, she just so. may lump me in with you, you know? We're two separate people. Oh, wow. So maybe she would like... A female perspective. I don't know. Okay. I've had lots of women say, so, okay, Charles, I got on board well, because of Rachel. It's, it's really not us that she doesn't like because she never met us. Um, 
so we're not offended by that. But there's something that we are asking or suggesting that she do that she's opposed to, and that would be controlling her spending, or that would be putting up with you being a control freak and telling her what to do all the time, or that would be there's something that she associates us with that's negative because being a grown up and telling your money what to do is not something people generally oppose. It's been opposed to me. It's the the common phrase is I'm not living like I'm broke. Well, okay. We there's the objection. Like we're not broke. Then there's the objection. We're be broke. <laughs> yeah. There's the objection. Okay. So she associates us with, uh, extreme frugality to a ridiculous level with no point. Yeah. And that's not, a, it's not actually what we teach. Obviously right. uh, we teach extreme frugality for a short period of time so that you can live like no one else. So that later you can live and give like no one else. It's the later part that she hasn't gotten or doesn't believe it can happen right. or doesn't believe it can happen. Okay. So, um, obviously you're going to have to take a different approach than you've taken. And if you've turned us into a cuss word, you can never mention us again. I don't, yeah. for the record. <laughs> yeah, doesn't do anything. I haven't for about a year. Doesn't do any good. Okay. okay, so I think you guys need marriage counseling. I've tried. Okay. Um, then you're probably not. Gonna, um, then you're probably not going to make it. Because if she says you're not worth, our relationship is not worth working on she's made she's giving you a really loud statement yeah i understand what's uh charles what's her what what does she oppose that that factor right that you marriage counseling what's what is her opposition towards that what does she say it's not really an opposition more of a i don't get a straightforward opposition it's more of a kind of a dodge of the question or the topic. I don't, I'm not a, my opinion is maybe she doesn't feel that she needs it or that we need it, mm -hmm. but I've brought it up several times. I myself, um, I'm all in favor of counseling and, and therapy and help. I myself started going to one or a therapist earlier this year just to improve myself, see if I can be a better husband to my wife, but a father to our kids. Yeah, I think your I think your therapist needs to guide you through these relationship issues. I don't think we're qualified. Okay. I, I, because I don't think this is about a budget and I don't think this is about Ramsey personalities or Dave Ramsey. I think, I think this is about, she's been hurt. She's scared. She's angry. Um, she doesn't trust. There's a lot going on here that I don't even know what it is, um, and apparently you don't either at this stage, and that's what you guys have got to work on. You've got to get to where you uh, love each other and, and will do anything for each other to serve each other and have a great future together, and right now, everything that comes up to better your life, you get a big shield that yeah. comes up, and that's based on fear or based on anger. Yeah, there's other stuff going there's on. There's other stuff going on there, and it's not, it's not us. I mean, it's not, it's not a, there's not, we don't, we're not the problem. And so we're also not the solution. That, that's what it comes down to. So I'm sorry you're facing that, man. It's a hard thing to go through, especially in a two year old marriage. I mean, it's just mm -hmm. awful. It's just not, it's supposed to be, it's supposed to be better than this, you know? But yeah, I, I think your therapist needs to give you um, some very specific things to draw out and, and, you know, because this is not a sustainable, relationship the way it's operating you're not going to be 40 years from today still married doing it this way i mean because people finally they just get enough and they're not going to do it. they're not going to live she's going to get enough she's going to run out with her hair on fire or vice versa so you have to be growing and working together or you can't stay together in a culture where nobody stays together been married 41 years. Sharon says we had 30 years of good marriage. So, <laughs> uh, actually, she used to say that when it was 37. Anyway, there's about seven, about seven years in there. You know, and, yeah, it's bad. The, fir the first years were rough. And, uh, but, yeah, it's, and it was mostly on me. So in that case, I don't know if this is on you. I don't know if you're being controlling and you're not. You don't sound like it in this call, yeah. but it doesn't mean you're not. 
Most- and, the, and the positive spin, Charles, is if if you guys get to that place, I think there's always the beauty in your two years in, which means the habits and what you guys can create as a foundation of your marriage can From be a point real, forward, yeah. Be I mean, it, you guys may just be doing this head collision that some people don't experience till 10 years down the road. You're doing it two years. Uh, but I, I hope that it, I hope that it works out and that you guys can see yourselves as a team. And again, like you said, just continuing to grow and who you are as people. Um, and stuff. Yeah. I, I'm going to, I'm going to, bet that there's a lot of stuff going on in her so yeah. and she may not even know that's the other thing that's what's hard that's yeah. what that's what a good therapist would do I, I really pray she would go because they're the ones that can unpeel those layers and that so much of the unconscious that we live that comes out in these ways right comes out that oh i don't want to i don't want to do i don't want to budget oh don't control yeah. my money i don't want to work on myself like there's there's a reason she's dodging all of if this. you say don't say financial peace don't say dave ramsey rachel cruz to me ever if you're out there and, and you you have a spouse saying that then it's your fault because you've used us as a weapon and we're not a weapon. We're teachers. And so you used us to try to control them and they don't want to be controlled. So instead of persuading, you tried to use a club and that's not how marriage and how relationships work. And so, you know, if, if, if I, if we have become a cuss word in your marriage, that's your fault because we didn't do anything to become a cuss word except try to help you. And we're not offended by that. It's not. We're not. There's no defensiveness at all in that. It's just funny, it, and but but and it makes great jokes. And those are all fun. We can have. We can. We can do all that stuff. But the bottom line is, is that you know you're being too stinking controlling, or you're using us as a club instead of you know. Hey, I learned this great new thing to get out of debt. We're gonna sell your car, honey. You know, yeah. Dave Ramsey said. You know that that was dumber than a rock. It didn't work. This is The Ramsey Show. Our scripture of the day, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will make your paths straight. Annie Downs, Rachel's friend, says, if you will go where you've never gone before, you will see God like you've never seen him before. That sounds very NES. I was just with, she was over last night. Well, there you go. Having dinner. And hanging out with famous, hanging show? out with famous people. No, well, but she is. She's my only famous friend. <laughs> Not. <laughs> I don't true. hang out with famous people. <laughs> just Not true. everyone be clear. <laughs> Not true. Not true. I know all of them. But yeah, there we go. I know. Paying off debt is smart. Saving and investing is smart. Protecting your finances. Playing defense is smart. There are 10 kinds of insurance coverage you might need based on what your life looks like today. And we built a tool called Coverage Checkup to show you which types you need to add, drop, or adjust. You can check it out. It's free. The Coverage Checkup at RamseySolutions.com slash checkup. RamseySolutions.com slash checkup. Graham is in Seattle. Hey, Graham. Welcome to the Ramsey Show. Hey, Grant, or hey, Dave and Rachel, it's an honor to speak to you both. You too, sir. What's up? So um, after struggling for about a year or two to get pregnant, my wife and I are expecting quintuplets. Whoa! Uh, Whoa. So we, <laughs> so we have five babies on the way. And, um, oh you know, we, we consider them a blessing. Uh, we are super excited about them. That doesn't mean we're not a little bit stressed about it. And um, I'm stressed already. Five babies. How far along is she, Graham? <laughs> uh, Friday is 25 weeks. Wow. wow. Oh, my goodness. How's she feeling? She's finally starting to eat solid food. So that's oh. a very good thing. So I'm, I'm guessing I'm guessing you guys are doing all kinds of things to uh, extend the pregnancy as long as possible, right? Like bed rest or whatever, all that kind of stuff. She's not a bed rest yet, but we actually did. We're temporarily relocated to the Phoenix area, um, the world's best 
quintuplet doctors here. Yeah. So his his goal is to get her to 34 weeks. Yeah, okay. His average is wow. yeah. two weeks. And so, yeah, we've kind of dropped everything in our lives to focus on this and uh, give these babies the best shot. That Absolutely. So yeah, great. that's that's uh, that, that's a lot of wisdom. Well done. Wow. What an adventure. Yeah. Yeah, it is. I'm not sure we have anything to add to this. <laughs> but um, anyway, well, how can we help? <laughs> well, you know, I think just my immediate question would be, so we are... Um, I guess we're on technically baby step four, but we're not really investing right now. We don't have any debt. Um, we have about 40000 in a bank account yeah. saved up. Yeah. And um, in terms of my work, I'm a freelancer. So my work is really all over the place. That's kind of the one, one of the major things I do struggle with. Um, I found success with it, and I'm happy about it, but it's definitely more random. Um, but I do have income coming in still, which I'm really thankful for. And so I think my immediate question for you guys would just be, is there anything unique that you would do, you know, over the next year, um, in this situation, we have no other kids. Um, I would put, I would put everything on pause until you get this situation stabilized. Okay. And that's going to, you know, that's going to be well into year one. Okay. No, I'm not. I mean, I don't. I don't have any insight onto the medical stability, uh, but you've got all kinds of potential things there. Uh, you've got to get all the medical things stabilized, but then you've also got to get just you know lifestyle. You just Life. your, just your house stabilized. Five beds, five whatever, right? Five million mm-hmm. diapers. I mean, it's like right. So, you know, there, there you just got to get a rhythm to this. This is this is five times as much. So, um, yeah. I mean, I, I think there's a whole lot of things you're going to learn about uh, creating sanity out of this in the first year. Does that make any mm-hmm. sense? It does. And mm-hmm. I, I, as big a pile of cash as you can have, and don't worry about investing, don't worry about the baby steps, just push pause, just a big stinking pile of cash, because that, that's one less thing to worry about in the middle of all this other, uh, this adventure that you're on. Yeah. Now, I don't want you using this to say, oh, we can never invest the rest of our lives. That's not what I'm saying. But I am saying let's get this to get the rhythm of the medical condition of the kids, the rhythm of how the household operates, processes, systems you all use to feed five, clean five, whatever. You get five to sleep, all that kind of stuff. You know, there's a process you're going to do that you're going to learn from other people and develop in this that's um, that, that's. Uh, gonna take a lot of your bandwidth yeah and honestly Graham, you guys i mean i would i would predict yeah even just the mental capacity to even have to think about money and stuff yeah. like don't even let don't worry more about it right like you have you have money in the bank and don't go in debt don't and yeah. don't invest yeah just don't let um for a year because you guys are it's gonna okay. be yeah there's gonna be no yeah more important stuff going on i feel like of like yeah so just knowing that that money is there there's cash available if you need it, um, yeah. but how to work. And the, way, the way I look at it is this. I mean, this is a type of investment in the mm-hmm. sense that you're investing in the kids, you're investing in the, the stability of your family, in getting this to a sustainable rhythm, you know, getting the, getting everything on, on a, you know, on a plane that it has a, has a, a reasonable level of, uh, uh, of predictability. So then you can start to say, okay, now we can invest. Now I can work this much. I can create this much income as a freelancer. We can invest this much. Well, you guys have help, Graham, family and. That's, that's kind of the other interesting part. So we, we live about actually an hour and a half north of Seattle or in the Northwest corner. Um, that's the part of the country my wife is from. However, her family has kind of migrated out of the area. Um, we will be living in her in-laws' house just to kind of get through this first year. They're like half and living in her Washington in-laws' house. house. Sorry, my in-laws' house. Her oh, house. okay. And, okay. Um, <laughs> it's already yeah. happened, Graham. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So that's good. Have- so you're going to be yeah living with family. Hearing we'll live with them. Um, we have a really good church community back there yeah, that okay. we know we're going to get a lot of help from. Good, My good. family is in Tennessee, though, so that's kind of the. I, I feel like the elephant in, in the room is maybe going moving to Tennessee long term, just the cost of living is so much better. 
But well, you know, I think, I, thing yeah, again, I think you, t- yeah. I think that's a choice you make after the year, after you get the year behind you. Gotcha. Yeah. Cause the, 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 the labor, the delivery, as, as you know, is a very specialized thing. You've made a specialized choice to move because of that. And, and the, there's just so much going on there. And, and then the, the, the setting up of, of, I mean, I don't know what else to call it other than systems. The operations of this oh, no, organization a, that is just—it'll be a well-oiled machine. Yeah, wow! Yeah, <laughs> you got to get it dialed in, and it's a thing. So, wow! So I'm so happy for you. Yeah, y'all. that's so exciting, Graham. So happy. Let us know how it turns out. That's just amazing. Yeah, so great. Want to hear the rest of the story, as they say, as Paul Harvey used to say. Sweet. But, yeah, little miracles. Uh, Bye. I, um, yeah, as a sidebar for the rest of you listening. I want to make real sure that no one misunderstood what I was saying. I am not saying large families can't do our stuff. I'm saying for a period of time, they are facing a very unique situation. Large families do our stuff all the time. There are also people that have large families that whine to no end that they can't do our stuff because they have a large family and that we just don't understand. Bull. You can use common sense even if you have a large family. You can live on less than you make and invest even if you have a large family. You can stay out of debt even if you have a large family. As a matter of fact, you especially need to, if you have a large family, do all of those things. And we have lots of people pull up in the... uh, in the sprinter and nine kids get out and they come in here and visit us all the time and do their debt free screams. And then they go, yeah, I read those articles that Dave Ramsey doesn't know about large families. And we're, we're pro Ramsey and we're a large family. You know, they do it all the time. So I hear it all the time. So that's not what we're saying. We're saying, we are saying if you're bringing home five newborn babies that you're okay. For a pause. short period of time, <laughs> you're going to have to put everything on hold and get your life Yes. In the in the uh, sane column, from the insane column. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. What a wonderful thing. Congratulations. Wow. That puts us out of the Ramsey Show in the books. We'll be back with you before you know it. In the meantime, remember, there's ultimately only one way to financial peace, and that's to walk daily with the Prince of Peace, Christ Jesus. It's Rachel Cruz. If you love the show and want a deeper dive on your money journey, we have a weekly newsletter that gives you trending and helpful articles and tips on following the Ramsey way. Just go to RamseySolutions.com today to sign up for our newsletter. Again, that's RamseySolutions.com to sign up for our weekly newsletter.